The Obama administration on Wednesday issued new guidance to help public schools in meeting their obligations under federal law to administer discipline without discriminating on the basis of race, color, or national origin. The following data shows that students of color face more harsher punishments for committing the same actions as their white peers. With an increased amount of law enforcement in schools, disciplinary actions can result in a student entering the criminal justice system. However, critics are saying that this is nothing less than imposing racial quotas in the school system and could lead to increased violence in our schools. To discuss is Daniel Lawson, the director of the Center for Civil Rights Remedies at the Civil Rights Project in UCLA. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. So over the past few years, many schools have adopted a zero tolerance policy. Now the government is saying we should end this approach. Why? Well, for many reasons, oftentimes these automatic responses are not just about kids who bring guns or drugs to school, but they're being applied to all sorts of minor infractions of the school code, things like tardiness or dress code violations or bringing a cell phone. And what this does is it pushes kids out of school. We lose tremendous instructional time. It dramatically increases their risk of dropping out and in involvement in the juvenile justice system. And these are just unsound education policies and practices. And the other thing is that there are real viable alternatives uh, that work much better to help kids improve their behavior and be productive in school. Now, groups against this guidance say that this will lead to increased rates of punishments for whites and will reduce punishments for minorities. How will this affect how schools discipline their students? Will they start disciplining more or less? Well, that's just patently absurd. It's laughable that people are saying that, and they obviously haven't looked at the statistics or the guidance provided by the U.S. Department of Ed and the Department of Justice. The guidance is really common sense uh, how to be effective in school discipline, holding kids accountable uh, for misbehavior, um, but proven effective evidence-based practices that help teachers through training uh, and help school systems through systems of support for kids, reduce misbehavior, keep more kids in school where they can learn, and these have proved effective in places like Baltimore. Denver, Oakland, cities across the country are already doing these things. So it's not just some academic idea of, oh, we could do things better. There are schools that have turned this around and in so doing have improved graduation rates. So those arguments are just patently absurd. Okay, but what if there's a greater infraction rate among, among minority students? What if more minority students are capable of, of are, are doing uh, bad behaviors. Does this deserve more punishment for this minority group? So if you, if your punishment is counterproductive, it makes no sense to be using it. So most people would say, for example, if we're concerned about a dress code violation, even if more black kids were violating the dress code, suspending a student out of school where, that they're, where they're more likely to uh, get involved in gangs and commit crimes, that makes no sense. There are all, there's a whole range of things right. you can do to enforce a dress code that doesn't mean pushing a kid out of school where there's no guarantee of adult supervision. Like I said, there are proven effective practices. And that's really what this guidance says. It's saying even if there's no intent to treat kids differently by race or disability status, and I point out that it affects kids with disabilities as well, that if there's no sound policy or if there's a better way to address the misbehavior that doesn't result in huge loss of instructional time, then schools really should do that. Everyone would want their kid to go to that kind of a school. Right, and studies show, research also shows that suspending a student benefits the students who were in trouble. It is not to benefit the student who was in trouble, but also studies show that a greater percentage of minorities are arrested than, than white teenagers. So if we're using this, what you call it, uh, desperate impact rule in the Department of Education, why don't we use it in the Department of Justice too? Why don't we have the, the same standards across the federal government? Well, actually, the Department of Justice jointly uh, filed the, these, these standards and this guidance. So it does uh, also apply to the juvenile justice system. But we have to remember that 
the, the whole concept here is that we're moving schools to adopt sound effective practices. If there's a legitimate purpose for the response, the punishment, what have you, and it's, it's an educationally necessary or in the justice uh, you know, context, it's important for safety, and it's, then there, if there are disparities that are really due to differences in misbehaviors, um, that's not going to violate civil rights. It's only when there are unsound practices or much better, more effective ways that schools can go about encouraging appropriate behavior and keeping kids in school. What, you know, if they're, if they're not using sound practices, um, that's where, and, and they're, they're punishing kids with disabilities or black kids a lot more than others, or Latino kids or English learners, that's where these guys All right, thank you so much. That was Daniel Lawson. He's the director for Center for Civil Rights Remedies at the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. Thank you.